All right, thank you. This talk's going to be a little bit different. The previous talk, we were talking about how to integrate the 66 books of the Bible uh, to settle a major uh, science faith issue. Here we're going to talk about how important it is to integrate the different scientific disciplines. And what we're going to take on is the history and evolution of life. And I'm going to focus on per particularly the discoveries that have been made in the past few years. And this is having a dramatic impact on the secular scientific community. So I want you to hear this. I want you to be able to share this. If you want to read it in more detail, I did put a probable planet. Let me begin with a, a Bible verse. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And concerning the earth, what it says in the book of Isaiah, God did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. And there were more species of life when God created Adam and Eve than at any previous time in history. In fact, when God created Adam and Eve, the number of species on planet Earth was at the theoretical maximum, which is about eight and a half million eukaryotic species and maybe 10 million uh, prokaryotic species. If you're not familiar with those terms, eukaryotic refers to life forms that are based on cells that have a nucleus prokaryotic, there are cells that don't have a nucleus. All prokaryotic life forms are microbial. They're single cells. Eukaryotic are predominantly multicellular life. So you know, when God, and what you see throughout the history of life on planet Earth is the number of species goes up and up and up and up. The first species basically transform uh, the chemistry of, and the physics of the Earth in order to permit the introduction of yet more species. This has been going on throughout the whole history of life, but it hits a maximum when God creates Adam and Eve. So he placed us human beings on the planet when we had the max, theoretical maximum diversity of life and were able to use that to launch our civilization. And also throughout that whole history of life, we have these life forms living and dying and generating biodeposits in the crust of the earth. When God created Adam and Eve, uh, the treasure of uh, biodeposits in the crust of the earth was in excess of 76 quadrillion tons. And it takes the form of gypsum, of uh, you know, oil, uh, coal, natural gas. Uh, we see limestone, marble. Those are all biodeposits. Even the metals that we mine are biodeposits because it took sulfate-reducing bacteria to transform the soluble metals on the early Earth into insoluble metals in sufficiently concentrated form that we can mine them and use them to launch our civilization. So you think of iron ores, lead ores, zinc ores, those are all concentrated by sulfate-reducing bacteria over the course of the first three billion years of life. But I want to focus on the fossil record and the brand new discoveries that we've come up uh, with the fossil record and how we can integrate that with the different scientific disciplines. Now, I've been debating evolutionary biologists for several decades, but what I notice that they share in common, they're either experts in genetics or they're experts in paleontology, but they really haven't taken the time to integrate their genetics and paleontology uh, with solar astrophysics or with lunar astrophysics, uh, or just with particle physics. So that's what I'm going to share with you today, how we can look at the history of life in a multi-scientific disciplinary fashion and draw conclusions I think you'll find quite stunning. All right. When we look at the fossil record, the greatest challenge to a naturalistic or materialistic interpretation to the history of life uh, would be the Avalon and Cambrian explosions. Now, uh, to give you some background, I'm going to show you how biologists classify life. And I think all of you remember this when you took your junior high biology classes, but this is just review. Uh, you know, species refer to like individual different kinds of owls, for example. But you put all the owls together and they form a genus. Uh, and then a larger category of life would be the families and the orders. So this is all in the context of what it would be for us human beings. 
So we human beings are part of the eukaryotic domain. Basically, life forms that are made up of atoms that have nuclei and are all part of the animal kingdom. So that's the next category of life. And the phylum to which we belong are the chordate phylum. And the chordates would include all animals that have a backbone. Those would be the vertebrates. But it doesn't just include vertebrates. It includes invertebrates that have a neural cord that runs down the vertical part of their body. So we're part of the chordate phyla. It's the most advanced of all the phyla of uh, animals. Uh, but what class we belong to, we're part of the mammal class. So we're mammal. And the order would be the primates. The family we belong to would be the hominid family. The genus would be the homo family. And the species, we're homo sapiens sapiens. Sapien means thinking hominid. And the joke in anthropology is, we humans think twice. We're homo sapiens sapiens, thinking, thinking, to distinguish us. Because if you use the term homo sapiens, that actually includes Neanderthals, uh, the Denisovans, and the homo erectus. Uh, but we're a distinct species. We're homo sapiens sapiens. Now, the Cameron explosion, as I mentioned, ranks as the greatest challenge to a naturalistic interpretation of life. And, on, and today, we look at the animal kingdom. There are 30 different phyla. By the way, the term phylum refers to basic body plan. And so our basic body plan, the chordates, is we have this long neural code, cord that runs down our body. Uh, so uh, 30 different basic body plans. And all, or nearly all, were present at the Cameron explosion 541 million years ago. And if we look at the Cambrian explosion, it's the sudden appearance of 50 to 100 phyla. So it's interesting, as half a billion years ago, there were more animal phyla on the face of the Earth than there are today. So from a materialistic perspective, evolution is running the wrong way. We started with 50 to 100 phyla, today only 30 are left, and new discoveries basically tells us the 30 that we have today are all fully present at the beginning of the Cameron explosion. I'll share with you about that briefly. But if you look up uh, Wikipedia for the Cameron explosion, it'll tell you uh, that it began 541 million years ago. The Wikipedia entry needs to be updated because there's been brand new measurements made. They discovered new radiometric tools they could apply to the Cameron explosion. And what they discovered was the Cameron explosion took place no earlier than 538.99 million years ago, but it's no later than 538.58 million years ago, which means the Cameron explosion event did not occur over a five million year window, which you'll see in the Wikipedia entry. It's now been shrunk down, thanks to these new measurements, to just 410,000 years. Now, that's the error bar. It's 410,000 years or less. But the maximum time in which to bring about all these phyla we see in the Cambrian explosion is only 410,000 years. So I think you can appreciate right away, if we're talking about the appearance of 50 plus phyla in just 410,000 years, there's really no possibility of interpreting that from a naturalistic uh, perspective. Now, what is new in the scientific literature, there's one outlier phylum, the bryozoa, that they said does not show up in the Cameron explosion. So what are these bryozoa? Well, this is what they look like. It's basically a colony of tiny marine invertebrates. And uh, they have these tiny tentacles. They filter feed. And uh, you know, to give you an idea, this is kind of like the seaweed you see down there at the beach. If you look in detail, they're composed of these very tiny animals that kind of link together. How big are they? Well, they're the size, the biggest ones are eight-tenths of a millimeter across, all the way down to one-tenth of a millimeter. So we're talking about something very tiny. And uh, they're moss animals, soft-bodied, uh, with tiny uh, tentacles that are invertebrates. And for this reason, with their body size is just one-tenth to eight-tenths of a millimeter, being soft-bodied. Uh, they're 
very difficult to fossilize. And so previously, paleontologists had dated the origin of these bryozoa to be 485 to 478 million years ago, meaning it would be the last of the major phyla of animals that does not show up in the Cambrian explosion event. So yeah, you have these, all these phyla we see in the Earth today, but the outlier would be the bryozoa. But what happened literally just uh, a few months ago, it's now about uh, nine months ago, is a team out of Australia and China uh, discovered bryozoa fossils in both South China and Australia in the early Cambrian. So now we got a new date uh, for these fossils, namely 438 uh, million uh, years, 538 million years ago. We now know they're at the very base of the Cambrian explosion. What does that mean? There's not a single animal phyla on the face of the earth today that we can't use fossils to prove they were there at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion. So what we have here is a sudden appearance of all these phyla, in fact, all the phyla on the face of the earth today suddenly appeared at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion in a time window briefer than 410,000 years. This has caught the attention of the leading paleontologists, and they've written papers in the recent scientific literature saying, we're faced with a profound challenge to a naturalistic interpretation of life. Because from a naturalistic perspective, life becomes gradually and progressively more complex according to the naturalistic model uh, through, four, uh, through common descent with changes brought about by four mechanisms. Charles Darwin said it was natural selection. Uh, a few decades later they said, well, it's not just natural selection, there's also mutations. And now they've discovered you can get changes through uh, gene exchange between one species and another, and the fourth mechanism is epigenetics. But all four of these mechanisms generate tiny changes within a particular species. And so it takes a lot of time for these changes to accumulate to make anything significant happen. And there have been papers published saying, is it possible that there's a fifth mechanism that we haven't discovered yet? After all, gene exchange and epigenetics, that was only established in the last 20 years. So is it possible we're missing something? And papers say, yes, it's possible, but if there is a fifth mechanism in operation, it's responsible for way less than 1% of the changes that are taking place. These four account for at least 99% of everything that happens. But again, all four of these mechanisms generate small changes. Moreover, you got the problem that they typically generate way more deleterious changes than they do beneficial changes. Say, so what's the ratio? At best, it's 10,000 to one. Now, most of the changes that take place through natural selection, mutations, gene exchange, and epigenetics are what we call neutral. They neither benefit the species nor they harm the species. That's true of us human beings today. Mutations take place within all of us, but the vast majority of them are neutral. They neither harm us uh, nor do they benefit us. But if you compare the deleterious ones, the ones that do us harm, to the ones that are beneficial, uh, at best the ratio is 10,000 to one. So what's the worst case scenario? 10 million harmful mutations or natural selection changes or through epigenetics or gene exchange, every one is positive. That's the worst case scenario, 10 million to one. Best case scenario, 10,000 to one. What does that mean? If you're going to get significant change with a species, you better be dealing with a species that has a huge population and a short generation time. And actually, this is something we can see in real time. So uh, there have been what are called long-term evolution experiments that have been performed by scientists in labs where they actually control what can happen to different bacterial species. They choose bacteria because they have enormous populations. There you're dealing uh, with trillions of individuals. Moreover, there you're dealing with a short generation time. There are bacterial species that by the time they form, they can reproduce 20 minutes later. So with us humans, it's 20 years. 
with bacteria is 20 minutes. And uh, with humans, you got 7 billion. Uh, with bacteria, you got quadrillions. And so the more individuals you have, the shorter the generation time, the higher the probability of being over, over to overcome uh, the huge difference between deleterious and beneficial. And you see that with bacteria. I mean, we had that with COVID. The reason COVID was so difficult to control is because of the huge numbers of these bacteria, uh, the rate at which they could reproduce. And so, yes, uh, we would use different drugs and therapies uh, to try to tackle COVID, and we would wipe out quadrillions of COVID bacteria, but there'd be enough to survive that they could benefit from the few uh, beneficial mutations. And what's been uh, published in the uh, literature is indeed life becomes gradually, progressively more complex for these four mechanisms. Uh, if there is a fifth or sixth mechanism, it's trivial. It doesn't do anything. And what we see in the naturalistic models is that through these four mechanisms, uh, if you wait long enough and you've got enough of a population, a short enough generation time, uh, through these mechanisms, you will eventually get a proliferation of species. And we actually do see new species appearing in real time. We see it with bacteria. We see it with certain fungi. There's some literature saying we may be seeing it with birds, uh, but there, the big caveat is how we see bird speciation is you get a flock of birds. Some of them fly over a mountain range. When they get to the other side of the mountain range, they reproduce. When you bring them back to the birds on the other side of the mountain range, they refuse to breed with them. And they refer to that as a speciation event. I don't call that a speciation event because if you actually bring the birds on one side of the mountain into contact with birds on the other side of the mountain and you wait a few generations, they'll begin to breed again. So if it's reversible, I don't call that a new species. But here's the problem. When you read the scientific literature, you'll find 16 different definitions of a speciation event. And the broadest of those definitions would mean, when we look at dogs, for example, we really should be classifying that as 440 distinct species. And so some of the definitions are as loose as a breed. Uh, but the definition we use at Reasons to Believe, it needs to be a non-reversible event. And in that case, you come up with a narrow definition. But nevertheless, what you see in the naturalistic literature is that the proliferation of species, if you wait long enough, will eventually produce a new genus. And if you wait much more time, the proliferation of genera eventually produces new families. The proliferation of families eventually produces new orders. And if you wait a really long time, the proliferation of orders will produce new classes. The proliferation of classes will produce new phyla. But here's the problem. When we look at the fossil record, it reveals the exact opposite of what you'd expect from a naturalistic perspective. When we look at things like the Avalon explosion, the Cambrian explosion, what happened after the Permian-Triassic uh, catastrophe, is the first thing you see is the proliferation of phyla, followed by the proliferation of classes, followed by the proliferation of orders. Last of all, you get the proliferation of species. It's the exact opposite of what you'd expect from a naturalistic perspective, but it's precisely what you'd expect that God is the one that's packing the earth with as much life as possible, as diverse as possible, as quickly as possible, in order to get all the biodeposits established in the crust of the earth so that human beings, once they're created, can quickly launch and sustain a global civilization. Here's some quotes uh, from atheist uh, paleontologists. Uh, James Valentine is probably the best-known paleontologist in the U.S. today, and he and two of his uh, colleagues wrote a recent paper where they said, the diversification of phyla occurs before that of classes, classes before that of orders, and orders before that of families. And uh, the emphasis there is in their uh, paper, basically making the point, this is the opposite of what we would anticipate from a naturalistic perspective. Moreover, new phyla appear more suddenly and earlier than the new classes, and the new classes more suddenly and earlier than the new uh, orders. 
and the new phyla appear first, not last. They appear simultaneously and suddenly. And what's not in the papers by James Valentine and Irwin and their colleagues is they appear immediately when the chemical and physical conditions permit their existence. So for example, we have the first Avalon explosion. That happened 575 million years ago. What happened 575 million years ago? You have what's called the great unconformity. I mentioned that in the last talk. What is the great unconformity? It's a tectonic event in the history of the Earth where you get these massive landslides off the continents falling into the oceans. You know, off of most of the oceans today, you have these continental shelves, basically these uh, shallow areas uh, that mark the border between the deep ocean and uh, the uh, continents. Those uh, continental shelves were almost entirely formed during the Great Unconformity. So you've got this massive landslides coming off the continents, pouring into the oceans, forming these continental shelves, but it also impacted what's called the deep oxygen cycle. And you can read about that in the book Design to the Core that most of you have. Look up deep oxygen cycle. And this is where you can get a sudden burst of oxygen into the atmosphere as a result of this geological upheaval. And what happened just before the Cambrian or Avalon animals showed up is that thanks to this uh, great unconformity, the oxygen content in Earth's atmosphere jumped from less than 1% up to 8%. How quickly did that happen? It happened with a time frame of just thousands of years. So the oxygen content suddenly jumps up to 8%. The moment it hits 8%, you immediately get the Avalon phyla. Animals need a minimum of 8% in order to be able to survive. And what you see in the Avalon explosion, they're all filter feeders. They don't have a digestive tract. They don't have a brain or a heart. There's not enough oxygen to support that complexity of life. But you see these sponges. You see jellyfish. You see creatures as big as two meters across. And they suddenly appear in a great variety of phyla the moment the oxygen hits 8%. Now, there's another tectonic event which brings about the extinction of the Avalon animals. Uh, that happened at about 541 uh, million years ago. They went extinct as a result of the, another tectonic event. But that same tectonic event that brought about the extinction of the Avalon animals boosted the oxygen content from 8% up to 10%. Now that it's 10%, you've got enough oxygen in the atmosphere to have animals with a digestive tract, to have animals with a circulatory system, animals with a heart and a brain, animals with eyes and ears. And so complex organs, a liver is possible, a stomach is possible. And the moment it jumps up to 10%, you immediately have the Cameron explosion. This is when you get 50 plus file of life uh, suddenly appearing. And so the Avalon explosion phyla appears suddenly, simultaneously, and immediately when the atmospheric oxygen content jumps from 1% to 8%, and the Cambrian phyla appears suddenly, simultaneously, and immediately when the atmospheric oxygen rises to 8 to 10%. Uh, and this is kind of what the oxygenation history of our planet looks like. Uh, it's about uh, one one hundredth of a percent for the first 2.2 uh, billion years. It jumps up to about 2% uh, during the first great oxygenation event. This is a major, this is coincident, by the way, with the continents forming. The continents forming, again, impacts the deep oxygen cycle. But as temporary, it jumps up, jumps back down to less than 1% remains that way, jumps up to 2%, and goes from 2% to 8%. You get the Avalon explosion. When it jumps up to 10%, you get the Cameron explosion. When it gets up to 20%, you got mammals. Mammals need 20%. Okay, how have evolutionists responded to this? Well, the Cameron explosion was well known even in the days of Charles Darwin. And if you read his book, The Origin of Species, by the way, what I like about the origin of species, Charles Darwin says, here's my theory of the history of life. It's materialistic. 
It doesn't involve God at all. But he says, here are some ways to test my theory. Here are some ways to prove that it's wrong. In fact, tonight when I speak in a church, I'm going to actually address one of Charles Darwin's proposed tests. What I find ironic, he made this proposed test 175 years ago. Only eight years ago was the test actually conducted. And the test falsified uh, Darwin's model. But for 175 years, nobody bothered to do the test that he proposed. But this is what Charles Darwin said about the Cameron explosion. He says, a sudden appearance of trilobites with no apparent antecedents and absence of other fossils is undoubtedly of the gravest nature to my theory. And we went on to say in The Origin of Species, to the question why we do not find rich phosphoriferous deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods prior to the Cambrian system, I can give no satisfactory answer. So before the Avalon explosion, you look at the fossil record, it's microbes only. All you see are microbes. You get to the Avalon, now we've got animals two meters across. And what Darwin was saying is, if my theory is right, there needs to be a progression from microbes up to these animals. We don't see it. All we see is microbes. Well, for good reason. If the oxygen content is less than 1%, our Earth can only sustain microbes. It can't sustain bigger life forms. Richard Dawkins wrote about the Cambrian explosion back in the 1980s in his book, The Blind Watchmaker. And this is what he said about the Cambrian fossils and the Avalon fossils. It is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. They suddenly appear and said this is totally unexpected from a naturalistic perspective. Uh, Gregory Ray wrote a long review in the Cambrian explosion, one that I mentioned last night, where he said the Cambrian explosion of body plants, referring to the phyla, poses an outstanding problem for macroevolution. Of what you'd expect from a macroevolutionary perspective, you'd expect the species to show up first uh, and the phyla to show up last. It's the exact opposite. And Kevin Peterson wrote, elucidating the materialistic basis for the Cameron explosion has become more elusive, not less, the more we know about the event itself. Now, as I mentioned, I've debated many evolutionary biologists on university campuses over the years, but I always spring on them in the debate is, well, have you taken into account uh, solar astrophysics? And the response is, what on earth does solar astrophysics have to do with the history of life on planet Earth? I said, it's got everything to do with it. Because the problem with your interpretation of the fossil record, you're assuming that the luminosity of the sun never changes. It does change. And that change has a dramatic impact on how we interpret the fossil record. So what I'm going to be speaking about with you in just a few minutes is what's referred to in the scientific literature as the faint sun paradox. And the faint sun paradox is basically a, how do we explain the long history of life on planet Earth, given that the sun today is much brighter than it was at the time of the origin of life. By the way, I will be giving a talk on the origin of life. And what's also interesting when I debate evolutionary biologists, they say, well, uh, what do you think about the origin of life? They say, we want to pass on that one. We're not going to talk about the origin of life. And so wait a minute. When it comes to the history of life on planet Earth, the easiest and simplest subject to deal with is the origin of life. Why are you bypassing that? And they said, we're willing to concede that one. We have no answer for the origin of life. I said, well, we got no answer for the origin of life, then you don't even have an answer for the history of life either. We need to start there. So I will give you a talk on the origin of life. But here's the issue in the context of the sun. Naturalistic life history models consider only life science data. All they look at is the genetics and the fossil record. They ignore the changing physics of the sun, earth, and moon. Now, all stars get brighter as they continue to burn uh, hydrogen into helium. And this is what the luminosity of our sun's history looks like. And so the luminosity of a star goes up with a fourth power of its mass. So when our sun was forming and accumulating mass, 
its luminosity was dramatically rising. Uh, but it reached a point of maximum mass, and it began to lose a small part of its mass. When it lost its mass, it cooled down. But then it ignited nuclear fusion, the fusion of hydrogen to helium. Our sun, you can consider it to be a gigantic hydrogen bomb. When bombs fuse hydrogen to helium, likewise, all stars are fusing hydrogen to helium. But the reason why stars get brighter during nuclear fusion as they fuse hydrogen to helium, the helium they produce means that the core of the star becomes more dense. And the greater density causes the nuclear furnace to burn more efficiently. So as hydrogen is fused into helium, it causes the nuclear furnace of the sun to grow ever uh, more efficient. And therefore, the sun today is about 23% brighter uh, than it was at the origin of life. And here's the problem. If we were to drop the luminosity of the sun by just 2%, it would cause a runaway glaciation. The reason why, if you make the sun slightly less luminous, that means you get more snow falling. Uh, that snow turns into ice. And what does snow and ice do? They reflect sunlight back to outer space. And so, for example, parts of our planet that are covered with snow and ice reflects sunlight with 60% efficiency. That's one reason why it's so cold in Antarctica. You get all the sunlight being reflected away with 60% efficiency. What's it like outside? Well, sunlight's reflected with about 20% efficiency. So if you begin to cover more of the planet uh, with snow and ice, you reflect away more heat. And what does that do? It causes more snow to fall. More of the planet gets covered with ice short period of time, 100% of the planet becomes an ice ball. And when it becomes an ice ball, uh, it becomes permanently uninhabitable. The same thing happens if you allow the sun's luminosity uh, to get greater. Increase the luminosity of the sun, what does that do? It evaporates more water from the oceans and lakes and rivers. And water vapor is a powerful greenhouse gas. It traps more heat from the sun which causes more liquid water to evaporate. And again, in a short period of time, uh, you wind up with all the water in the face of the Earth becoming steam. And once again, the planet becomes permanently uninhabitable. The truth of the matter is, if even if you change the sun's luminosity by a tenth of a percent, you get catastrophic consequences for the advanced life forms. The bacteria can handle a 4% change in the sun getting brighter or 2% cooling, but not creatures that are more advanced uh, than bacteria. And even the bacteria will eventually go as you get this runway. So how does the creator deal with the increasing luminosity of the sun? And for what it's worth, of all the stars we know to exist, the sun is by far the stablest of all stars. Uh, the sun uh, has the most gradual increase in luminosity. Other stars uh, were looking at a much more serious situation. The way God deals with the increasing luminosity of the sun is that he creates just right life on Earth at just right times. So it's life on planet Earth that compensates uh, for the increasing brightness of the sun. Now, I told you at the very beginning that all these talks I'm going to be giving you would be equation-free. They're actually going to see the equation right now. It's not an equation of mathematics, but it is an equation of chemistry. So, but hey, this is just basic high school chemistry, right? You, you all remember this. Uh, you've all been exposed to this. And what we're looking at here, you're all laughing. I mean, gee, surely you remember all this stuff, right? <laughs> okay, I'll break it down for you. The continental land masses are made up of silicates. You say, what on earth is a silicate? Calcium, silicon, oxygen-3. Silicon uh, with three oxygen molecules, that's a silicate. You can put sodium here, you can put iron here, it doesn't matter. But yeah, the continents begin with silicates. So uh, we're looking at silicates. But what we have on the continents is water is falling on the silicates. The water acts as a catalyst. Do you remember that from your high school chemistry? that certain things can act like a catalyst. They don't participate in the reaction, but they facilitate the reaction. 
So we got falling liquid water coming on the silicates and the water combines with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, reacts with the silicates, and what you get is uh, calcium carbonate and sand. So the silicates get transformed into carbonates and sand. Now, here's what's valuable for humans. The silicates are a worthless industrial product. But the carbonates are crucial for making our concrete. So, and that's our marble, that's our uh, um, uh, limestone. Limestones are basically uh, carbonates. And then you get sand. If you want to make good concrete, it's carbonate uh, plus sand. That gets where you get your concrete from. So these are really valuable uh, industrial commodities. So valuable that there's industries in India that are trying to buy up all the sand in North America and Hawaii and ship it over to Asia because they're running out of sand uh, and they're running out of carbonates. So, but the bottom line is this. This reaction of silicates to make the carbonates and the sand pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. And so, as this reaction runs, uh, more and more carbon dioxide gets pulled out of the atmosphere, which means less and less heat gets uh, tra uh, trapped uh, uh, by from the sun. Now, different life forms will cause this reaction to run more rapidly or more slowly. For example, bacterial mats, such as this one that you see in Yellowstone, that will cause uh, carbon dioxide to be pulled out of the atmosphere. But because these mats are lying low over the silicates, it's a very slow reaction. Much more rapid, uh, when you've got cryptogamic crust. So instead of a millimeter thickness, now we've got a thickness of about one inch. And uh, you won't find uh, these in uh, Hawaii, but if you go into Colorado mountains, the high mountains of Colorado, uh, the high mountains of Canada, you'll find lots of these cryptogamic soils, and they pull more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And once you get to plants, like ferns, they pull 10 times as much carbon dioxide of the atmosphere as cryptogamic crust do. But the real champion for pulling carbon dioxide of the atmosphere are trees and especially conifers. Now, this is a granite mountain in Yosemite National Park. But if you look at this mountain, you see conifers are growing all the way up even to the very top. You see these uh, conifers growing. And these conifers, have the capacity, you can put a seed on bare granite, and as it produces roots, the roots will find little tiny cracks. The roots go into the cracks and they expand the crack. They're actually more powerful than the granite itself. They can actually push the granite apart and be able to drill down. And that's why these conifers can grow on solid granite. The roots basically penetrate in, pull out the hidden water uh, that's in that uh, granite and pull out the nutrients. But what it does, by creating these cracks and drilling new holes, it exposes a lot more of that granite to falling rain. So instead of just the surface of the rock being exposed to rain, the interior of this mountain gets exposed to rain, which causes much more carbon dioxide to be pulled out of the atmosphere. This is called the carbonate silicate cycle. It produces valuable industrial products and it pulls greenhouse gases of the atmosphere. It's a win-win for all life here on planet Earth. And today, that compensates for 80% of the brightening of the sun. You say, well, that's not enough. We need to get to 100%. Well, the other 20% is predominantly uh, dealt with by the burial of organic carbon. And so here's a rainforest and uh, you've got uh, vegetation growing and dying. And as it dies, uh, we have this heavy rainfall that causes creeks to run and uh, buries it. And so what happens is instead of this organic carbon decaying and releasing carbon dioxide and methane to the atmosphere, which are greenhouse gases, uh, the falling rain and the erosion causes them to be buried in these mudslides. And therefore, instead of decaying into carbon dioxide, the carbon gets trapped into the interior of the earth. The tectonics pulls that carbon into the deep mantle of the earth. And that accounts for 20% of the compensation of the brightening of the sun. 
And there's actually four factors that life uh, does uh, to help. Uh, the predominant one is the erosion of silicates. The next most important one is the burial of organic carbon. And at the 1 and 2 percent level are the fact that uh, life changes the organic chemistry in the cloud cover. I mean, here in Hawaii, for example, where you've got lots of vegetation, you get a lot more clouds. Why? Because plants, and especially trees, transpire water to the atmosphere. So if you go to the Amazon jungle, for example, more than half the rainfall comes from the transpiration of water from the plants and the trees. In fact, that's a big a worry about the Amazon, is that they strip the Amazon of the jungle trees, they're going to turn the Amazon into a desert. So one of the wettest places on Earth can be made a desert just simply by stripping the vegetation off. So it does affect the clouds. And then the color is important. So different uh, plant material reflects sunlight uh, with uh, different efficiency. So for example, a tree that produces white or yellow leaves will reflect more sunlight than a tree that is deep blue uh, or deep uh, green leaves uh, like this. But the bottom line is this. Someone with a mind who knows the future physics of the sun, the earth, and the moon must remove no longer compensating life and replace it with just right life forms at just right times in just right amounts and in just right locations. But in order to make sure that human beings have the maximum biodeposits they need to launch and sustain civilization, it's crucial that the Creator step in and remove life from planet Earth that's not sufficient for compensating for the sun's increasing brightness and replace it with new life that is more efficient at drawing these greenhouse gases of the atmosphere. This is important because one of the challenges of non-theists uh, to the biblical creation model is they say, why would an all-loving God uh, generate mass extinction events? Because we look at the fossil record, we do see these mass extinction events. Uh, a mass extinction event is where at least 50% of the species of life on planet Earth gets suddenly wiped out. And the fossil record reveals dozens of these events. And they say, well, why would an all-powerful, all-loving God work that way? Well, it's because an all-powerful, all-loving God is committed to prepare our planet as quickly as possible for the entry of human beings and ensure that these human beings have all the resources they need to launch the civilization so that the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ can be taken to all the people groups of the world uh, quickly uh, rather than uh, slowly. And this is actually stated in scripture. You see it in Psalm 104, the longest of the creation psalms. This is what it says of life. They die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created and renew the face of the earth. So this is actually a biblical principle uh, that God will step in and remove life from planet earth and replace it with new life where that new life is perfectly designed to compensate for the now brighter sun than existed previously. And when atheists come and say, well, how can you can explain these mass speciation events that we see in the fossil record? Here's a response. Every single mass uh, extinction event in the fossil record is followed almost immediately by a mass speciation event. And so, yes, millions of species are removed from the earth, but as soon as conditions stabilize again, immediately millions of new species appear, and these millions of new species are exactly what you need to compensate for the increasing brightness of the sun. And I did mention the physics of the sun and the earth. As you heard me say uh, a couple of days ago, uh, yesterday actually, is that the moon is moving away from the earth. And as the moon moves away from the earth, that changes the tides of the earth. And so it's not just God compensating for the changing physics of the sun. He's also perfectly compensating for the changing dynamics between the earth-moon system. Because the moon moves farther and farther away, that gradually weakens the tidal effects. It actually affects the rotation rate. Uh, because the moon's gravity is slowing down Earth's rotation rate. I mean, what we physicists do, every New Year's Day, we adjust the clocks back by a few microseconds because the Earth does uh, rotate more and more slowly thanks to the gravitational interactions 
we receive uh, from the sun and the earth. So for example, 150 million years ago, uh, our day was 23 hours. 150 million years from now, it's going to be 25 hours. However, if it was 23 hours, human civilization would be impossible. If it's 25 hours, global human civilization, likewise impossible. What's ideal for us is 24 hours. Uh, when the Earth-Moon system was first formed, Earth had a rotation rate of just two hours a day. So it's been gradually slowing down. But from God's perspective, he wants to make sure everything's in place. All the biodeposits we need are in the crust of the Earth at the moment the rotation rate hits the optimal level for us human beings namely 24 hours a day. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. And one of my favorite verses, Psalm 104, 24, how many are your works, O Lord, in wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. From a naturalistic perspective, you would anticipate no wisdom at all in the history of life on planet earth. This psalm verse is telling us all through the entire uh, history of life, we see wisdom at each step. God carefully uh, planning out exactly what needs to be there at just the right time. I'll take the remaining time for questions. And again, it doesn't have to be in this subject. And hey, we still got four of these treats left if you ask a good question. Yes. Yes. Okay. We have observed new species in real time. We've not observed a new genus in real time. Uh, but the theory is, hey, if you get a sufficient proliferation of new species, eventually it might generate a new genus. We certainly see that there's been new genera showing up in the fossil record. However, that could be a supernatural event. Uh, in real time, we can determine whether it's natural or supernatural. From a biblical perspective, God's at rest in the human era. So everything we observe will be naturalistic. This is another way to challenge a naturalistic model. The fact is, when we look at life in the human era, it's very different than what we see in the pre-human era. In the pre-human era, we see the generation of new genera, new families, new orders, new classes, new phyla, in the human era, we see maybe the proliferation of species. We've yet to see a new genus. We've yet to see a new family. Now, the response of a lot of evolutionists is say, well, we've only been here for maybe 100,000 years. That's not enough time. It actually is more than enough time. If what we're seeing happening in the Cambrian explosion, the Avalon explosion, at the uh, uh, you know, Cretaceous paleogene event, that tells us these things are happening rapidly, and therefore this is strictly naturalistic. We should be seeing it in real time. We're not seeing it in real time. Therefore, this is a profound challenge to the naturalistic model. And this is frankly admitted in the papers that have been published in the last two years. So that's what I'm sharing with you, is that textbooks need to be updated, because even the leading atheist paleontologists are saying, hey, Thanks to these new discoveries, materialism is not the answer. It doesn't work. It doesn't mean they've all become Christians, but they are admitting that a strictly atheistic perspective fails to answer the history of life. And this is new. This had, three years ago, this wasn't the case. Now it's the case. And again, what they haven't even looked at, they haven't even looked at the solar astrophysics. That's a new add-on that we're putting in. That's why I'm hoping our books like Design to the Core an improbable planet get widely distributed because that's the missing factor in this debate. But even if all you look at is the genetics and the paleontology, that's sufficient to refute the naturalistic model. And one thing I didn't share with you, uh, in genetics you've got these molecular clocks. And, but if it's naturalistic, the molecular clock dates should be identical to the fossil record dates. The answer is they're not. So, for example, for several of the Cameron explosion animals, if you look, try to analyze their appearance with molecular clocks, the molecular clocks predict that they should show up a quarter of a billion years before the Cameron explosion. The fossils tell us no, they show up right at 538 million years ago. 
not 750 million years ago. So the very fact that the molecular clocks don't coincide with the fossil evidence tells us it can't be naturalistic. Now, from a biblical perspective, you could have them different or you could have them identical. But from a naturalistic perspective, they must be identical. By the way, that was a really good question. You deserve one of these treats. Yeah, go for it. Um, I've got a couple questions. So in your talk this morning about the flood, um, what was your rebuttal to Genesis, Genesis 7, 19? Yeah, we covered 7 as 19, basically saying the phraseology you see there in the original Hebrew is identical to the phraseology you see in Genesis 8, 9, where it talks about the dove flying over the water. And yet, previous to the dove flying over the water, we got Noah seeing the distant hills. Okay. So it's basically making a point. Genesis 7, 19 must be interpreted from the frame of reference of Noah on the ark. From his frame of reference, all he could see is water from one horizon to the other. However, that does mean that the flood can't be minor. I mean, theistic evolutionists are arguing that the Noah, flood of Noah uh, was kind of like the floods we have here in uh, Hawaii, uh, floods that we're having in the state of Washington. No, if it's from one horizon to the other, that's at least a 300-mile diameter. So it puts a minimum size on the flood. Okay. And then in Genesis 17, it says, understand, and this is God talking, understand that I'm bringing a flood. Flood waters on the earth will destroy every creature under the heaven with the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will die. Um, it's saying earth and not world. Right. Um, okay, and when speaking about all life will die, again, I made the point. Look up the Hebrew verb for the animals that are used in Genesis 7 and 8. Okay. And the key word there is the word basar which means a nephesh animal, an animal that has mind, will, and emotions, and able to be tamed by humans and relate to humans. But the word basar is more specific. It's referring to nephesh animals that are in relationship with human beings. And the book of Leviticus tells us it's only those animals that are damaged by human sin. I think that came up in the Q&A last night, uh, where it says in the book of Leviticus, if a cow has a habit of goring other animals or people, the owner of the cow is to be rebuked. And if the cow continues in that behavior, the cow is to be killed and the owner is to be killed along with the cow. Basically establishing the principle, the reason why that cow is goring other animals and people is because that cow is owned by a vicious human being. Same thing with the vicious dog syndrome. Vicious dogs have mean owners. And it's not that the dog is a sinner. The dog's trying to bring pleasure to its human owner. These animals are motivated to please their owners. And what brings the owner pleasure is vicious attacks and killing other animals and people. That's how the animal will behave. But it's also making the point that the only way animals will behave that way is because of their contact with wicked human beings. And you also see this uh, when the children of Israel uh, go into the land of Canaan. So when they go into Jericho, what does God say? You've got to kill all the people and kill all their animals. Their animals are damaged by the sin. But other cities, he says, you don't have to kill the animals. The wickedness of the people is not so extreme that the animals have been damaged. But in the context of Noah's flood, God would not kill off animals that had not been damaged by sin. There's no reason for God to eliminate all the emperor penguins, because those penguins would have had zero contact with humans. And by the way, when you go to Antarctica, what you notice is the penguins have zero fear of humans, because they've never been abused by humans. Now, the worry is some tourists are actually treating the penguins as footballs, and so they're training the penguins to be afraid of humans. And so it's changing the behavior of the penguins. So, and I'm going to be speaking tonight. Uh, if you go into places of the world where animals have never been abused, they will not run away from you. They come to you. They want relationship with you. But if they've been abused, they run away. And if they've been seriously abused, they have to be put down. Uh, you know, I've had friends who had to put their dog down because a dog was attacking everybody that they could find because a dog had been owned by a very 
uh, wicked individual. Yes? Uh, so I just had a question. It's uh, when God's covenant with Noah went uh, about the rainbow, um, and he said um, in chapter 9, verse 11, I establish a covenant you, with you that never again shall all flesh be covered from the waters of the blood. Is that just human flesh you're thinking of then? Or? Well, he's basically saying, here's a promise. Never again will I bring a flood that's going to wipe out all wicked humanity and all the animals with it. There will be floods, uh, but we're not going to wipe out all of humanity uh, who is in a category of being wicked. So, for example, uh, there are wicked people today. They're not being wiped out by floods. So, and in terms of the rainbow, there are nine covenants in the Bible. God always signs his covenant agreements with something that's familiar with the people. When you look before the flood, it uses two words for precipitation. The words in Hebrew are ed and matar. And so people have drawn the conclusion there was no rain until the flood. Well, the words ed and matar have this distinction. Small drops of water falling from the sky and big drops of water falling from the sky. The most faithful English translations translate those two words as mist and rain. But the people think, well, there was only mist before the flood. There was no rain. But guess what? You get a rainbow with mist, just like you get a rainbow with rain. So Noah knew all about rainbows. So, and it depends where you live. Where I grew up in coastal British Columbia, if the raindrops were less than 3 sixteenths of an inch in diameter, we called that a mist. Uh, if you were in the desert, you wouldn't call that a mist. You'd call that a, a rainstorm. It's all relative. Okay, uh, we're at 12 right now. I can take one more question because they haven't rung the bell, or I can let you all go. Okay, I'll let you all go.